So the difficult uh, subject that I was uh, given to Nick, it's about clinical trials more in general, but also maybe some pitfalls that we um, might see in CLL trials, and then maybe how, with the help of you, we could think of uh, novel trials, but also uh, how to find actually which trial is going on for your disease. So my, sub my topic is in the beginning more general, so what is a clinical trial and a lot of wording that maybe you're not so used to, what do they really mean? And then in the end of the talk, I focus more on uh, CLL itself. So um, the definition of a clinical trial, just by definition, is that it's research done in human beings. And uh, so the first step actually is why is an, in trial important? Because we can do a lot of observations in, uh, in the lab, in, the, in vitro. We can do a lot of observations in the mice, but a lot of um, theories, a lot of of data that we gathered in the lab actually may or may not apply to human beings first. And second, they can go with a lot of side effects that actually we don't know so much what they are doing and how people will react to that. So without those trials, and actually for yeah, some patients really feel sometimes that they are also a lab mouse when you join such a study, but it's really true that without such trials, we could never give safe and effective treatments for all diseases actually. So you have a different kind of trials. You have diagnostic trials, so which determines how, what tests should be best applied. And I have to say that, and it's also according to what Costa said, we actually don't do enough of those uh, diagnostic trials. It mostly is retrospective, and diagnostic trials of the diagnostics pretty much go with the flow of the development. As soon as we had, as we had a, uh, as we could do mutation status analysis, we start applying it. As soon as we have now NGS techniques, we start to apply it without really knowing how to look at it and what to do. And I think it's extremely important that we come to a uh, consensus and a conclusion uh, for according to approximately um, uh, P53. Uh, Costa has introduced very well P53 mutation, but the problem is that the detection limit actually goes with the technique we use. You can uh, report 10% uh, of mutations, but with new techniques, and the more expensive you go, the deeper you can go, you can maybe also find uh, mutations in 0.01% of your cells if you go very deep. The question is, is it clinically relevant or not? And if we don't know those questions, we start to either under-treat our patients, or, and maybe that's even a bigger problem, we're going to over-treat patients because we don't know the values. So diagnostic trials, I think it's still a bit underdeveloped in, in CLL, and I think it's very important to do. But most, much more known than diagnostic trials are, of course, uh, clinical trials to test new treatments, new treatment combination, or at all new uh, approaches to your patients. And another thing that actually was also not that active in CLL is starting to be more, is quality of life trials. And actually they should go along with clinical trials, um, real clinical trials. And why I think it's important, because if we start to treat patients for very long periods of time, specifically with this new uh, agent, with this new kinase inhibitors of anetoclax, you can be on treatment for years and years. And according to my talk in this morning, then quality of life issues became more and more important. And a very good example is that actually I had a patient uh, two weeks ago and I introduced her to a trial of mine. And I kind of uh, was very proud to say, well, but maybe without, uh, we, we don't have to treat you now for six months with chemotherapy. I can treat you for two years with a non chemotherapeutic regimen. And instead of uh, that she was cheering and said, well, that's a very nice that I can join this trial. She said, so that doctor, that means actually that instead of making me six months a patient, you're making me two years a patient. And I thought that was a completely different way than we look at it as doctors. And I think that's very important to very closely look to quality of life, specifically if you give treatments for a prolonged period of time. And, and then you have, of course, the issue of uh, sponsoring. And uh, so clinical trials are, because of all the regulations, uh, it's getting more and more expensive. And they are actually funded by the companies that make these pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceuticals or, in some instances, medical devices. And um, yeah, that means that, that actually, as a doctor or as a study group or as Eric, you become, you, you have to be very clear on what you want, but you have to, but you also get a financial uh, conflict of interest sometimes because a company really wants to get certain results and, and you as an independent doctor should really prevent that it's too much of a, of a uh, disturbed balance. And I'll give you some examples later. So how do we test it if, if you go into a clinical trial? Well, in some studies you compare it to placebo and a placebo is a product that looks like the new drug 
that you have no clue if it's a new drug or it's no drug at all, and it should not have any uh, active ingredients. And uh, actually, there were some not for CLL but for other diseases. I had a talk. Um, I heard a talk a few weeks ago about a trial that actually the placebo arm was doing excellently well, and there was uh, some kind of um, of uh, powder inside or one in, 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 uh, something that also had metabolic influence on a cancer. And so that was a very interesting signal that also a placebo cannot be placebo sometimes. Um, mostly in cancer, uh, you don't, of course, it's not very ethical to, uh, for real treatment, for first line treatment to compare to placebo single agents. So either it's a combination treatment or you compare it to the best available treatment that you have so far. And you have something that it's uh, blind and double blind. And maybe it's also good to uh, a little bit explain what that means. Uh, so a blind trial is that the patient don't know if he or she receives placebo or, or a real new treatment. And double blind, and actually in most cases, most phase three trials, uh, that uh, specifically registration trials that uh, have to be uh, judged by the FDA or the EMA, so the other official uh, authorities, are double blind, meaning that both the doctor and the patient don't know if the patient gets a, a placebo or a, a real drug. Then you have a process of randomization, and it's also good to, it's also some of those very much trial definitions, and what the randomization is telling you is that um, patients are, div are, are uh, divided in subgroups. So some patients get treatment A, some patients get treatment B, and that can be uh, randomized, but also stratified. Stratification is another word that's good to understand what it means. So randomization is just that without any influence of the doctor or the patient, you are just randomly assigned by a certain group, but it can be stratified. And stratified means that at the end of the trial, what you really want to prevent is that you have maybe more males in one group or more females in the other group, or if you go back to the 17P deletion of Costas, if you have a trial that uh, sh should include both 17P minus patients and, and, and non-17P minus, it would be a terrible uh, misstep if at the end of the trial you find out that all your 17P patients are in one arm and not in the other arm. So patients can be stratified for that, meaning that it's still randomized, but behind it, there is a computer actually checking if there is still a balance. So that can mean that if we have five patients with 70p deletion going to arm A, then the next one should go to arm B, although it's still randomized. So you still, as a patient, you don't know, but it is influenced in the, back, in the background by, um, by stratifications. So then if you go to the different phases of a trial, so you have preclinical, which is uh, more the laboratory part, then you have uh, safety studies, you have a phase two trial that is still about safety, but now also it starts to look at uh, effectiveness, but doesn't compare to anything. A phase three trial is about effectiveness, but it compares it to a standard treatment or to placebo. And phase four is more and more important, as I will show, is actually a drug that is already approved. And according to phase three trials, it had a certain result, but how is that true for real life? And that really also goes to the discussion that Costas had with one of you, um, that uh, the, the people that go in a trial is really very different maybe in sometimes than the real life patients. So why do we need preclinical trials? Because we need to know actually what's, what, what we are doing, what kind of dose, what kind of effects you have before any clinical trial starts. And although animal studies are still necessary, more and more it, it happens actually that, that this step is um, is, is, is skipped, is, is not giving. For instance, abrutinib was pretty much immediately from uh, laboratory done in uh, patients and there were no big mice studies to, to study at first. Interestingly also, if you think about this concept, um, abrutinib is uh, inhibiting BTK, as you know, and there, was a, there is a well-known patient group that actually lacks uh, a BTK just by, uh, by genetic disorder. So you, we pretty much knew already what would happen if you have a BTK deletion, if you, um, if you have those patients. So phase one trial is actually done mostly in uh, healthy volunteers. I never know exactly who, what kind of people volunteer for that, but it happens. Um, sometimes they also get money for that, and it's really to look at what kind of dose you get uh, certain side effects. Then you get a phase 1b that you first start to treat patients and those patients will get a all different doses. So normally what you do is you give three patients a certain dose. You just wait a month, see if you get any unexpected toxicity. You go to the next dose and next dose until you reach your uh, kind of ceiling of, of toxicities. 
And because of that, and I think that's imp very important also for you as representatives of patient advocacy programs, is that if you talk to people, they all always want to be in a trial. You can have uh, old drugs, but a lot of people want to join cl uh, clinical trials. I think the problem is if you enter patients in a phase one trial, you really should not have a very good alternative because a phase one trial, you really do it mostly for toxicity and you look, of course, to effectiveness, but it's actually a toxicity trial. And to join a toxicity trial when you have a very good uh, non-trial non option, I think that's actually bad medical practice. So you really should only do that in patients that you don't have good alternatives without any trials. Phase two trials, now you really go to your patient with a large group of people and you really look now to effectiveness. You know the safety dose from the phase one, so you're not going to play around with the dose anymore. You're just going to use your regimen to tell something about effectiveness. And you can actually have two different models. So this is a non-randomized phase two trial that we just finished in the Netherlands, where the question was, uh, if you add now lenalidomide to chloramicil rituximab, which is the favorite still uh, combination for elderly patients, if you add lenalidomide, what would happen? So patients uh, would get this uh, regimen followed by lenalidomide for six more months. And we're actually analyzing this data now. So Hopefully in a few months we know the data, but it's a typical phase two trial non-randomized. But you can also have a phase two trial randomized. So it's a new trial of us. Um, what we will do is um, uh, give a combination of abrutinib and uh, venetoclax on those patients. And actually the plan is that if patients are MRD negative, we will either randomize them to stop treatments or continue treatment, um, not looking to the MRD. And the whole goal of the trial is to see if uh, you can actually stop those very expensive new drugs, which maybe might be beneficial for the patient, but also might prevent uh, resistant clones. And so now you have a randomized phase two trial, and it is possible. The only thing that you are not allowed to do is really compare those two arms. So at the end of the day, you get data on this arm, you can get data of this arm, you can tell which one has the best numbers, and then you can compare them, but then, but these studies you can do in a few hundred patients. If you really want to compare those two arms, you need maybe five to 600 patients. So a phase two trial, you can never compare arms, but you can have different regimens and tell the end something about uh, the efficacy of separate therapies. For three trials, you really need a lot of patients. For cancer, mostly uh, up to 300 or higher. If you look to cardiology trials, with, uh, for instance, with um, uh, statins, uh, so cholesterol inhibitors, uh, you really need thousands of patients, depending on also on your, on your outcome. And you have a lot of different models. So what you can either do is pretty much in the beginning of treatment, you can compare treatment A or treatment B. And you can even compare treatment A, like the study that uh, Costas told is pretty much this one, ovatumumab versus abrutinib. Ovatumumab was stopped after six cycles and abrutinib was continued. So that's a real randomized phase three trial. You can also have another trial that you give, that was the study that was shown uh, earlier, that um, uh, the maintenance therapy for ovatumumab, which was also a Dutch trial. So you give FCR or whatever you want, then you randomize, and then you give either no treatment or placebo treatment, or you give treatment B, and this was in this case ovatumumab. Another important thing is crossover. That's also a lot of heard in trials, and it's also good to understand what that means. And crossover means that if you fail on treatment A, you automatically can go to treatment B, which is a very big problem if overall survival is your endpoint, which is the most strong endpoint that we have. But the problem is that if you start to treat patients with a different regimen than, than how they start, then overall survival difference will be very difficult. So you need to think very clever about other endpoints than overall survival, but this is a very common treatment now, specifically if you have effective drugs and you want to compare it to another effective drug, you cannot give placebo. You need to do, do another way, and uh, a lot of times the FDA actually requires you to have a, a crossover, which is, of course, safer for the patients. And then you have endless variations of all the three types. You can make it as complex. You can have uh, two or three randomizations in one trial, depending on your study question. So a uh, example of a phase three clinical trial is the new trial, which is a Dutch Nordic uh, an, um, uh, German trial, the CL13 or Gaia trial. So here what we will do is patient will be randomized in either uh, standard therapy, FCR or BR, or see if we can go without any chemotherapy. So rituximab venetoclax is one th quarter of the patients 
Gazaiva, uh, so the new, anti the new CD20 antibody with venetoclax, or the antibody and abrutinib and venetoclax. It's a very large randomized study, and, uh, but hopefully this will give, of course, a lot of answers. And another example of a uh, phase three trial that actually the randomization became after treatment. That was is a Dutch being finished, and it will be this will be an oral on the ASH. It is a German trial that they said. Well, what we know from FCR is that patients do very well. We discussed this morning for a few times already. But if you are MRD positive, if you can still detect leukemia cells in the blood with very sensitive flow cytometry measurements then you do not so well. And what it said is, well, if you have, uh, we don't care in this trial how you treat them, as long as you have treat, treated with something, then you can do MRD status to see if the patient is positive or negative. And positive patients either got placebo or get, got lenalidomide maintenance. So now the randomization is not before the treatment, but is after the treatment. And then if a drug becomes successful, then you need to go for um, approval, or sometimes it's approved already, and just the the, the doctors wants a new uh, indication or maybe a new combination. But then you have the whole process of going to the FDA or to the EMEA, and they can either approve it or they can require to a company to do another trial. What's very good to realize is that for approximately every five to ten thousand of compounds that enter preclinical testing, only one is approved for marketing. So there is. For one question, you can say, why are all these drugs so high? And I am not a pharmaceutical company. I think some representatives are here. I think the price is sometimes ridiculously high, but it's also good to realize that there is a lot of R&D going on, and it's actually only a few drugs really make it to the clinic, and most drugs actually will fail earlier. What's very important to realize, again, what Costas also said, is that a trial population is, not, is really not the same as a real-life population. Because what are the general rules if you want to put a patient in a trial, he should not have a history of cancer. Almost all trials exclude those patients because you don't want to have an, an, an um, yeah, blurring of your survival because of other cancers. You are not allowed to have an active infection. Well, as discussed also earlier, most patients with CLL do have a higher risk of infections. You are not allowed to have CNS involvement, meaning that if you have a patient with CNS involvement, that happens. You really have no clue uh, how you can use the new drugs because they're always excluded in the trials. You're not allowed to have HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. You're not allowed to have any recent comparable drugs, which is really a pity because if you fail on one drug, you really want to know the activity of, of, of a new drug in those patients. And there are a lot of more, actually, rules in trials that make them difficult to apply for your general patient population. And to give you one example of something, but it's pretty personal how I feel about this trial, but maybe if there is any... any um, discussion or debate, we can, of course, uh, do that. But it that is the trial, abrutinib versus glambricil in first-line CLL. So because of the success of abrutinib, this trial came that glambricil was compared to abrutinib. Looks like a very nice trial and I think a very valid question. But now if you look very carefully to the study, what you will, oh, one back. Yeah, so what you see here is that the dose of glambricil is actually very low. If it's too low, nobody knows, because we have, we have had trials in, uh, for 40 years in CLL, but the drug that actually has most commonly been used from the 60s till now, we, don't, we never did a dose-finding study, meaning that there are a lot of regimens for chlorambucil, and nobody knows what a good dose is, but this is actually really the kind of the bottom that we can give. So it's a low dose of chlorambucil. Then if you look to the patient, you always get, if you go to a meeting, this table, and it's mostly the time that people look either to their iPhone or take a sip of coffee, because it's always not that interesting. But if you really look carefully, I think there are some lessons to learn from this group. So that means that what are the characteristics of the abrutinib patients versus the chlorambucil patients? And something you see here is that normally if you have first-line patients, the reason to treat is not so much big lymph nodes, because you don't need real treatment for big lymph nodes unless they, are, they, are, they give you trouble. But the most, re the most commonly used reason to treat patients for a CLL is if their bone marrow function is going down, right? If your hemoglobin or thrombocytes are going down. And what you see here in this trial is that actually a relatively large portion of patients had bulky disease and a very low portion, only one third of the patients had, uh, maybe one fourth even, had bone marrow problems which actually might tell you, and that's psychological, very understandable, I think, that if you have a very new drug, 
that both the doctor and the patient really want that patient to start on that drug. Those trials are competitive, meaning that at a certain uh, time, all patients are, have been recruited and you don't get this drug anymore. And specifically in the United States, where drugs are extremely expensive if you have to pay them yourself and your insurance company doesn't help you so well, there was maybe very much an urge to get patients into the trial. So you might consider maybe that here, patients went maybe a little bit too early in a trial than you would normally do. And I don't know if that's really true. The only thing what you, what I think it is really true, what I say is that normally, as also discussed earlier, uh, unmutated patients have a higher uh, risk of progression. Uh, so normally in all the trials so far, unmutated patients were actually um, uh, much higher in numbers than mutated patients. And in this trial, this is not the case. It might even be the other way around, really telling that maybe this is a different group that got treatment than, than other patients. And that's why these phase four trials are very important. It's very important after the trial has been published that we still do research and we still check how the patients are doing in real life. And for instance, a, a study from the Israeli group led by Ir Herishanu here, they checked frontline therapy with FCR in a real life CL, uh, population. And if you look to the conclusion, what they actually see here, that it's indeed true that um, you get long remissions, but they say it's shorter than clinical trials, which is not that unexpected because now you have a real life population. And the other thing is that uh, many patients in their studies had dose reductions. And that is because you, now you have patients that are a bit weaker, that are not well screened, more or less well screened than normal. And so that's why you see more uh, side effects also. So I have to hurry up a little bit. Um, so the time that it takes for a drug from preclinical to FDA approval takes, uh, sometimes it can take very long. And for abrutinib, for instance, for these very new drugs, it was actually extremely quick uh, according to what happened all before, because it was really this new drug which was approved after only a phase two trial because it was an unmet need, which is really special because normally the FDA would require very prolonged large uh, phase three trials. Then something about the costs is that it's um, uh, yeah, really expensive to do this trial. So the German trial that we will do with the Nordic countries and the Dutch is this four arms is 30 million, meaning also that, uh, yeah, that the industry has a lot to say about it. So that's, that's something that's always to keep in mind. Another big problem for now specifically for CLL is that diagnostic trials are generally lacking. And that's why that's one of the reasons that we have this big disparity between trials and real life. We have used the SEER score. You probably, I think you all have heard of that. It's kind of a fitness score. And I spoke uh, recently to Valentin Gude, who did the trial, the CLL11 trial, where the uh, SEER score was used. And I said, well, how do you come with the SEER score? And he said, well, Michael Halle came into my office and he said, we really need the quality of life. We need something like a good score. And there was not one available. So he just uh, looked and it was a psychiatry uh, paper years ago that introduced the SEER score and it worked pretty well, but it was really never tested in the CL population. So I think it's interesting that it's used like that and it probably works, but there was never been a real trial. The other thing is that in trials, we always want to have bone marrow biopsies and CT scans. But if you look to outside trial, you don't need that. So your response measurement in a trial by CT scan is completely different than in real life when you only use physical examination. Um, this, I skip a little bit. Yeah, so one more thing about this trial that was already discussed. Also here, if you look very carefully, the very famous trial, Lucaron, Chlorambucil with one of the two antibodies. If you look to the dose of Chlorambucil, it was indeed much lower, four times lower than you would normally give in, in a lot of other countries. And also the level of antibody, rituximab is the normal dose of 375 uh, milligram per square meter followed by 500 milligram per square meter. GL101 is higher. So it's not only that you compare different antibodies, but you're also comparing different dose of antibodies. And if comparison, the UK trial, where they did the same, almost the same uh, trial, chlorambucil monotherapy versus chlorambucil was ofatumumab. There you see that the level of chlorambucil was four times higher than the CL11. So also comparing different trials might be difficult because it's a little bit of apples and oranges what you compare. So last thing what I want to say is, so if you have a, want to join a trial, how can you find it? So you can always ask your doctor and if the doctor itself doesn't know, you should, that's actually a good reason for a referral because there must be somebody in the country who probably joined these large trials. You should check the website of the patient advocacy groups, but, and we discussed this with Jan before, 
there should be a very good link between the patient advocacy group websites and the hematology, uh, more than a professional hematology website, that the, the same trials should be very easily found by the two ways. And but this is, I think, not very friendly for patients, but you have a website called clinicaltrial.gov, and all trials registered in the world should be, uh, should be put on that site. So that's something to search for, but it's very patient unfriendly, I think. So I think, although you can say a lot about trials and also about the caveats of trials, because of all the new drugs, now more than ever, we really be, need patients to participate in trials as much as possible. Thanks. Thank you, Arnon. Um, uh, do we have any questions? We do have a little bit of time for questions. I, I'm beginning to see that uh, a few of us might be a little bit uh, peaky or tired. It's coming to that stage. Mm -hmm. But there are a few questions that I've maybe got there. I, I, I think that seem to have come out of that and from my own areas working is a lot of commentary there about real life information, um, potentially real world data. Um, I've got a question. What is your opinion about the level and depth of information that is actually collected now or has been historically in clinical trials um, in that area? Yeah, I think that, that it's, well, you see that also in Israeli trial. I think it's um, more, well, yeah, it, it, for the trials so far, specifically the registration trials, the industry trials, it's pretty much you want to exclude all kinds of risks. So I think you have both, you have two kinds of trials. You have the sponsor, the, 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 the pharmacy can be uh, the sponsor, but you also have trials that actually the, the CLL working group of some country or maybe an, an intergroup can be the sponsor. And I think in those trials, you try already to make it more like a real life patients, but it's really a debate. So for the trial that I presented with obinutuzumab and uh, venetoclax that we want to do in the Netherlands, actually, we said we want to have patients in there who had uh, who could have had cancer a year ago but if they had a curative option then it was then f we thought it was okay and then we get actually we didn't get approval for a trial because the safety uh, office from uh, abvi wanted us to uh, say well you must be five years free of cancer and we said well you can do that but then it again it doesn't apply to the patients after the trial so what but did you only get maybe a safety signal in a, in a selective group of patients. And finally, we got to kind of an agreement, kind of a, uh, a, a um, in between, that we said two and a half or three years or something. But it's really something that the, the CL group, the doctors really should pursue more and more to make it a real life uh, disease uh, and, and the trial, but it's, it's, a, it's a struggle. 